Institute. My name is Julian McKinley. I am the Senior Communications Director at DOWI. We're excited to present Ownership Now for Equitable Recovery at a critical moment for small businesses um, and the communities in which we live. These are unprecedented times um, and it calls for anything but really a return to normal, um, a full embrace of an ambitious pursuit of economic justice. And today we're joined by DAWI's leadership and program area experts to present ownership for equitable recovery. With us are Melissa Hoover, DAWI Executive Director, Shivanti Daniel, Senior, Senior Programs Director, Vanessa Brandsburg, Senior Managing Director, and Olga Prusinskaya, Metrics and Impact Analyst. Uh, we'll have a few minutes to answer questions following the presentation. Uh, thank you to those who did submit questions beforehand. Um, you can submit questions during our event uh, in the chat, questions from Melissa, Shivanti, Vanessa, or Olga, um, and we'll do our best to answer your question in the time that we've allotted today. Um, you can use the, the chat function in your Zoom menu. Um, today's event will be recorded. Um, if we can go ahead and press the recording button, um, Olga or Shayla, thank you. And uh, we will be using Zoom's polling feature throughout our event. Um, I want to make sure that we are able to share ideas and be engaged throughout. Um, and then what, what that will look like is I'm going to go ahead and launch our first poll for you. And you can go ahead and tell us what your relationship is to the worker cooperative community. I'm just going to move that a little bit so you can see all our faces. Um, during the presentation, uh, please mute yourself. Most of you should be muted um, already. Uh, you can unmute yourself when we get to our question and answer section by clicking on the microphone icon in the lower left hand corner of your screen. Um, your video is also off just to, to minimize any distractions while our presenters are speaking. And um, I will now go ahead and introduce Melissa Hoover, DAWI's Executive Director, to open up today's event. Good morning. Thank you for We are thrilled to see so many people here. Um, I want to take a minute to locate us in time and place. Uh, in some ways, you know, the world has felt like it's stuck in amber for the past year between the pandemic and national politics. Um, but the reality is that things are happening. A lot of complex things I don't pretend to fully understand. I do know systems are straining and breaking, and this means people are suffering. It also means they're looking around for and creating their own solutions. So I think we're at a turning point for openness to strategies for organizing our economy, how we work, how we care for each other, how we live, where we put our resources. For instance, during the past year, we've seen not just an openness to explore, but a commitment to act on the part of cities that see employee ownership as a solution to their priority problems, so business retention, good jobs for everyone, uh, and equitable economic growth. So the case is being made for us, um, which is a new kind of experience for us in the employee ownership community and, and worker co-ops in particular. So at Dowie, we're making a shift from making the case to making the change we think needs to be made. We believe it's critical to illustrate that now is the moment to move with increased urgency, strategic focus, ambition, and in the radically collaborative ways demanded by our current economic and social crises, as well as the opportunities that they're presenting us. So what's different about now? Um, framing around the recovery and rebuilding helps us focus our work on equity. We've always been committed to racial equity, it's one of our pillars along with scale. But as we say, there is no equitable recovery without broad-based ownership of the economy and empowered workers. So recovery gives us a way to talk about this and to envision the future we wanna see. Taking a, an approach that centers racial equity and low-wage workers means rethinking how things are done and really designing for the people at the center um, you know, when communities have been systematically stripped of wealth, they're going to need different capital tools. When employment isn't even an option for some workers, they're going to need different forms for organizing work. When there's a whole new generation of people leading worker ownership projects coming from places as disparate as racial and climate justice movements, city government, unions, impact investing, and often no movements at all, the practitioners entering the field are gonna need new networks of support and tools for learning. 
So we have spent the last year studying, discussing among ourselves, developing strategy with the US Federation and our other field partners. And today we're presenting the strategy that has emerged from this period of reflection. So first, we're shifting how we work. Dow is taking a three-part approach to all of our work um, to demonstrate, enable, and embed successful solutions. Those are the three parts. This is meant to keep us grounded in meeting material needs and orient us towards changing systems at the same time. You can sort of think of an arrow or a progression from demonstrate to enable to embed. Um, to get a little deeper into it, you know, in all of our work areas, we are demonstrating a successful solution and innovation that meets people's everyday needs and then we're documenting it and learning from it. And you'll hear about these demonstration projects from my colleagues later on. Uh, secondly, we're uh, aiming to en enable others to use these successful solutions. So the ones we've demonstrated, but others as well. So that for us means sharing information and data and training all of, you know, that good kind of stuff. But it also means we're sort of actively focused on removing barriers and creating supports for worker cooperatives to thrive. That's about building networks, helping move resources, helping move policy, things that make um, other people's jobs easier. And then finally, we aim to embed worker ownership solutions in systems and institutions of power. So that's schools, financial institutions, unions, government, um, the logic of economic development. The goal is to build institutional support for worker ownership for the long run. So we move from immediate to long run over the course of those three, that three-part strategy. That's the how. We're also shifting what we work on. We're working in three core areas focused on needs exposed by the past year, but actually continually urgently relevant to the state of our economy uh, in 2021 and before. So in all three of these areas, we'll be using that three part approach. Um, the first area is unlocking ownership capital. So this is about ownership. Um, and it's about equity in both senses of the word. We think that there's not enough of the right kind of capital available to worker-owned businesses, particularly those started by black and brown people who have been locked out of business ownership. And that's equity capital, risk capital. As our friends at Common Future say, you have to shift capital to shift power. And that's what we're aiming to do. So in the area of unlocking ownership capital, we have a demonstration project, the Legacy Fund, which Shivanti will tell you more about. Um, our work to enable other partners in the field includes the New York City Owner to Owners Hotline, the National Worker to Owner, Workers to Owners Collaborative. We're sharing learnings and fostering relationships and aiming to stimulate greater investment out of the legacy fund. Um, and then finally, the embed part of this strategy is public capital. We believe there's a really important role um, for publicly available capital um, through the government to support private initiatives. And we'll be thinking and talking and advocating for that. The second area of what we work on is innovating better livelihoods. So that's about labor or work and using the cooperative form and its aggregating power to create access to work for the growing number of people locked out of an employment relationship. Again, that's overwhelmingly black and brown workers who have turned to entrepreneurship by necessity. It's also the broader pool of low wage workers. Um, so the demonstration project there is our rapid response cooperatives and Vanessa will tell you more about those. The enable part of that work is really our hands on approach walking with partners to help develop co ops using this franchise model. Um, but also researching new forms, staffing cooperatives, platform cooperatives, secondary co-ops for micro business owners, um, really playing with and innovating on the way we structure work. Um, the embed part of the livelihoods uh, work area it aims itself at the worker, uh, sorry, at the workforce development system, connecting quality jobs and layoff aversion to worker cooperatives. Um, and at the local, state, and federal level, making sure that worker ownership is a priority within workforce development. And then the final area of our work is helping allies succeed. So that's really about meeting the needs of current worker developer, worker co-op developers, but as importantly,
growing and anticipating the needs of the emerging field. So this is getting people what they need to do their best work, making sure that we are ready together for the moment, thinking strategically together, doing our work better together. Um, concretely for DAWI, this work is our data and metrics, uh, our communications, our policy work and the School for Democratic Management. Um, and, and for us, this work mostly takes place at the local level. There is still national work happening, um, but the strategic focus is at the local level in support of the capital work area and the labor work area. There's a strong place-based dimension to helping allies succeed and helping build the field as it no longer exists in a theoretical or strategic space, it's real now. And it, that happens in a place, the, the folks building and developing and improving economies get it and implementation um, of helping allies succeed really means working within communities in places across the nation. The demonstration project for this work so far has been our seed program, the shared equity and economic development. That was a enormously successful pilot project to help teams at the city level um, envision an employee ownership ecosystem. Um, Coming out of SEED, we want to enable more cities, um, our partnerships with, with municipal government, but also um, other groups at the city level um, to roll out employee ownership initiatives, um, hotlines, rapid response co-ops, whatever it is. Um, and then an, a key part of our enable work is the open data project, uh, which Olga will be speaking to later in this session. And then the embed part of helping allies succeed is really policy for the most part working with municipal agencies, helping pass local and federal policy um, that shifts the logic of local economic development um, and small business supports and workforce development to incorporate worker ownership. So that's sort of setting the, the context. My colleagues will get much deeper into it. Um, and they're my framing thoughts. I mean, I think sort of we're in a moment for action and experimentation and we need to place work. And this changes how we work, what we work on, and who we work with. So we're taking this three-part approach to demonstrate, enable, and embed. And then we're working in three areas, unlocking ownership capital, innovating better livelihoods, and helping allies succeed. So I ask you, my ask of you is to listen for yourself and your work and your organizations in these presentations. And I invite you to take what's useful and I urge you to come to us to help shape the work further and to reach out to us to discuss and collaborate. Um, so with that, I'll say I'm so excited for you to hear from my colleagues a little more about the details of these work areas. Excellent, thanks, Melissa, for that strategic overview and context setting. Um, clearly, um, this is a, uh, we're all living in a strange time and uh, having to do extraordinary things and we're excited to share that with you today. Again, I'm Shivanti Daniel, I'm the Senior Programs Director. Uh, I've been with DOWIE for about five years now. I'm excited to share a snapshot into our business conversions work. And um, also talk about the future of, of the work in the field. So as we all know, wealth inequality and poverty in the US is growing and COVID has exacerbated this. Um, inequality is growing in particular for black, indigenous and people of color. It's growing especially among people who are already working full time. There's an increased number of workers with no way to build wealth and um, no job security. So worker ownership can be a powerful tool to building better and more secure jobs that create wealth for workers. But the power of ownership can't be unlocked without capital. The years of research and hands-on work that um, Dowie has been doing with partners and municipalities have helped us identify capital as the strategic priority. Back in 2015, we convened and now lead the workers to owners Collaborative, which is a national collaborative of 26 technical assistance providers and lenders whose members to date have converted over uh, 99 or close to 100 companies. Over 1150 pathways to ownership have been created because of their work and over 40 million in assets have been transferred to workers. We've also prioritized the growing interest in worker ownership among cities 
working hand in hand with city champions to address the pressures faced by BIPOC workers and business owners. Our research and reporting has helped identify the potential closure impacts and viable businesses in critical industries that cities can help protect. Our partnerships with the National League of Cities has launched the Shared Equity and Economic Development Fellowship, which has helped dozens of municipal leaders understand the value of shared ownership. Uh, these municipal leaders now have developed shared ownership implementation strategies that work with their economic development departments and have deepened their commitment and investments in ecosystem building. In each of these past projects, we've witnessed and helped create moments of success. Best practices have been developed, trends have been identified through data collection, money has been moved to build ecosystems supportive of legacy business preservation. More communities now recognize worker ownership as a proven way to retain local businesses and a way to build ownership pathways, in particular for BIPOC workers. That's clear. We no longer need to argue the benefits of shared ownership. The value of local communities and the opportunity afforded to, to workers is clear. The challenge that continues to be faced and impedes progress at scale is access to capital, both debt and equity. Unlocking access to ownership transition capital is the leverage point capable of producing the change at scale needed to meet the crisis head on. This work though cannot be carried out alone. And it's why our work will continue to be highly collaborative. As a field, we won't succeed if we work in silos. So in our next stage of work, we aim to demonstrate, enable and embed these new strategies. Our programs are designed to contribute to the success of others in the field and bring them into this work. This includes current and future partners. This year's programs will build and showcase projects aimed at developing new models and tools that can be responsive to the moment, gather data and share lessons from demonstration projects, build tools and standardize management, governance, operations, and data practices. And we will work collaboratively to inform and shape policy to leverage public capital. The first of these demonstration projects that I wanna highlight is um, Legacy Business Fund. The Legacy Business Fund with APHIS and Heritage Capital Partners aims at unlocking access to ownership transition capital. APHIS and Heritage is the first black led employee ownership investment fund. It's designed to identify thriving businesses with BIPOC workforces make equity investment purchases of these businesses, transfer the ownership to the workers, and then support the companies with organizational culture and governance using best practices from participatory management and co-op development. This project is our effort at demonstrating a model for financing ownership transitions. The fund will not only build equitable companies and provide pathways for wealth for workers of color, it will also create high quality jobs and empowered workforces. The availability of appropriate capital is the central roadblock to scaling conversions. We believe that the legacy funds capital model is particularly important to unlocking ownership opportunities for BIPOC workers. In our effort to enable and embed, ANH and Dowie will share lessons learned with field partners bring in new capital oriented racial equity focused field partners, investors and financing organizations, and also business focused groups. With this demonstration project, DAWI will build educational and training tools and relationships that support democratic access and control of capital. Our work to enable and embed new strategies is also taking place through our local work with municipalities and partnered work uh, on federal policy. Employee ownership is now seen by local and federal influences, influencers as an urgent and compelling part of building an equitable, sustainable economy. Putting employee ownership on the local and federally, federal policy map is particularly important um, in, for retention of businesses and as a wealth building strategy. Employee ownership can be integrated into existing local and state programs, unlocking needed public capital for training, 
technical assistance and outreach programs. We can also proactively get the word out through business support hotlines and communication campaigns that make employee buyout options easy to learn about and technical assistance easy to access. Finally, businesses are running out of time and leveraging local governments to help stabilize paused small businesses by using everything from eviction moratoriums to capital access programs to bid outreach and early warning approaches that could help forestall closures while transitions can be planned. As we look ahead at the coming weeks and months, DAWI will be announcing new strategic partnerships um, and strengthened partners that are already working with DAWI. We, our staff, um, have been dedicated to helping community leaders avoid compounding or reproducing the failures of our economies. We look forward to sharing the growing momentum behind the use of worker ownership to support an equitable recovery. Learning from this demonstration work and um, pointing to the opportunities to collaborate and expand this work throughout other organizations. Please reach out to me if you're interested in collaboration and the future of this work. Um, I look forward to talking to you. Thanks, Javanti. Um, before we go on to Vanessa, um, first I want to share the fill in the blank answer to our first poll. Um, the answer there was 19,000 is the, the gap uh, in capital. Um, and we're going to take one more poll um, about contingent workers. So again, fill in the blank. Um, this comes from Gartner, a business research and consulting firm um, who's looking at how businesses are responding to the uh, pandemic. And um, the, the message here is to cut costs, blank percent of firms are replacing full-time employees with contingent workers. And go ahead and take a guess there, 10%, 17%, 23%, or 32%, and we will share the answer in the chat. And while you're guessing, I'll go ahead and introduce Vanessa, who will talk about innovation for better livelihoods. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you so much, Julian. Well, I'm very moved to be here with all of you today in the space. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Vanessa Bransberg. I am the Senior Managing Director here at Democracy at Work Institute. And just a little background on myself, um, I'm a trained social worker um, who landed in the worker co-op development field 13 years ago um, in Brooklyn, New York. And I have been particularly involved in supporting the development of worker co-ops um, organized by immigrant communities. And so I'd like to start today by sharing a little anecdote um, to highlight the need and urgency for our Innovation for Better Livelihoods campaign, our second area of work that was mentioned earlier. In January of 2019, Jose Higuera Lopez, um, who's the Deputy Director of the Mexican Studies Institute at City New University of New York, CUNY, was introduced to us by a local New York City cooperative developer. He had been meeting in his office with some of the recipients of the BICA scholarship program to explore the idea of forming a worker co-op with those graduating from CUNY and needing to access good work despite their having barriers to employment. And so this underlined that for undocumented students, fellowship programs, scholarships, and other informal arrangements are unsustainable upon graduation. And without work authorization, they can't work um, as payroll employees. And so they were looking to the worker co-op model to set up quickly and be accessible for students who would offer a variety of services. And so at this very time, um, DAWI had been working on creating solutions to this old problem. This aspect came to us reinforced the fact that this urgency and need for workers was not new. And so in this particular case, we responded by collaborating with CUNY on developing a rapid response cooperative, an RRC as we call it, which we branded as Radiate Consulting. And so this story highlights that our best students are being locked out of jobs. Um, there is a whole generation of talented young people being left out of good work opportunities. And so we know that financial and professional insecurity dominates the horizon, not just for young people or dreamers, 
but for all contingent workers without work authorization. Contingent workers continue to patch together gigs, um, independent contract work, without a pathway really to sustainable and quality work. And so the new norm is celebrated, as we see, by a system that really fails to meet the needs of workers. And so what we're doing here in terms of demonstrating this RRC project is to use a franchise-like model to create worker-owned cooperative staffing agencies called Radia Consulting that are member-managed LLCs or limited liability companies where the members are owners. DAWI um, does this by working in partnerships with community organizations, universities, and cities to replicate these RRCs in their geographies or industries by licensing the model and networking the cooperatives at formation for shared services and benefits. And finally, we connect these newly formed co-ops to, to a member-led movement of worker cooperatives. I'd really like to emphasize here that partnerships with local institutions like city agencies, universities, or community organizations are foundational for the success and the expansion of this particular model. And partners can become, in this case, their role is to be anchor clients, to be pipelines for contracts, and they also really help recruit the initial membership of these RRCs. To give you a little context of what we've done so far and what we're working on, we have developed rapid response co-ops in partnership with CUNY, the City of San Francisco Office of Civic Engagement and Immigrant Affairs, Cooperación Santa Ana in California, and we're currently developing a new tech-based RRC with Code the Dream. And more, moreover, we are in a stage of feasibility planning with the University of Texas at Rio Grande, Sonoma State University, and a cohort of workers in Los Angeles um, for a total of three new rapid response co-ops. So in terms of expanding right, this model and really scaling it up, um, by design, the RRCs are meant um, to be developed within a three to six month window, it's very quick, and um, to be replicated in a variety of locations and industries, as I mentioned earlier. What allows for this rapid replication and therefore scale of the model is the brand and, and name license that's offered, as well as a vetted toolkit um, which has been created in collaboration with a, a multiple um, technical assistance providers in the field of co-op development. It has also integrated learnings from more than 20 years of LLC co-op development with immigrant communities. The Radio Consulting Co-ops are networked. That's another really important element. And what does this mean? Um, they provide, this provides professional connections amongst the, the cooperatives. It provides training and access to larger uh, contracts for the members of those radiates. DAWI began the RRC actually with a focus, as I mentioned at the beginning, on recent graduates. And at the time, we have been actually thinking about how to leverage this RRC model uh, for other workers who work part-time, who do contract jobs, who are patching work together, um, such as community um, health workers, COVID contact tracers and community organizers who have actually expressed interest in this radiate model uh, for themselves. And so as you can see here, the goal is widespread replication and growth. We're looking at the RRC model to build, um, to build scale um, with our partners. <clears throat> and so as we are piloting the RRC model, we know that there are other needs and that one model does not fit all. And so this is why we're working on other demonstration projects um, that create access to good work for workers that require innovative approaches. More specifically, we're looking at models which aggregate economic power um, to meet the needs of micro businesses for black and, black and brown workers. Some of the models that we're looking at are secondary cooperatives for micro businesses because we know that the majority of business ownership in black and brown communities are micro businesses. We're also looking at platform cooperatives for freelancers. Uh, and we actually have been consulting uh, with the US Federation of Worker Co-ops on their Gilded project, which uh, focuses on freelancers and contingent workers. And finally, we're looking at staffing cooperative models for temporary and contract workers. We've consulted on the California Harvesters project, which is an employee trust for farm workers. I wanna highlight that these are not necessarily worker cooperatives, uh, but they are cooperatives or other forms that create access to work 
to stabilize and strengthen members' work lives. And so for these demonstration projects, we are in the research and design phase of the work. Uh, we're aiming to learn from these and to share our learnings with, with you all. As we demonstrate pilot projects and enable the use of innovative cooperative models, we know that we need to change the workforce development system. And this is the embed part of how we do our work. More specifically, we need to look at getting worker co-ops institutionalized into the workforce development system on several fronts. First, we want to make the connection between worker co-ops and job quality. We need to unlock workforce uh, funds to provide training to increase job quality and worker participation. And secondly, we need to connect business retention to layoff aversion. We know that workforce development is concerned with preventing layoffs. So we actually think that the best way to prevent layoffs is to retain businesses by selling them to their employees. Workforce development funding should be available to support the conversion strategy. This area of work, uh, as you know, is, is at the policy and communications level for DAWI. And so some examples of the policy work that we've been consulting on is on the federal bill called the Emergency Economic and Workforce Resiliency Act, which provides states with five years of federal funding to invest in workforce systems interventions to reduce and prevent unemployment. Secondly, we have advised on the California seed funds through the California Department of Labor, which includes the first ever dedicated worker workforce development funding for worker co-ops. And in all of this work, um, we are building partnerships in this area. Within our field, we're working with our sister organization, the Federation, and some co-op development organizations using workforce uh, approaches. Um, those include co uh, Cooperative Development Institute, the Industrial Commons, Concerns Capital, and others. We are also consulting with worker centers and domestic workers organizations in Los Angeles, California, who receive workforce development funding to implement their work. So those are just a couple of examples of some of the policy and partnerships that are developing. And so we know that our policy and communications work essentially aims to make our partners work easier. That's really what we're looking for. In the coming year, we plan to roll out projects that work directly with the workforce development field. And so in closing, uh, I would like to leave you with two areas to reflect on uh, regarding the, the livelihoods campaign. First, we need new forms to create access to good work for people who are locked out. If you see yourself doing this work, we want to do it with you. Partnerships are essential for the success and expansion of new and innovative models that support all workers uh, currently blocked from good work. And secondly, we need to lean on what we have learned about the models that have worked for BIPOC communities in the past and the present and work to build and replicate thoughtfully and efficiently. We don't want to only do what has been done before, right? Um, we need to use our learnings, but try new forms. And so I want to thank you so much uh, for listening to this presentation. I'm really eager to talk to many of you in the coming months about the livelihood campaign and together draw from our collective wisdom to shift the economy and genuinely, genuinely benefit the workers who make our communities run every day. Thank you. Thanks so much, Vanessa. And now we will turn to Olga Pershinskaya, who is our metrics and impact analyst here at DAWI. Olga. Thanks so much, Julian. Um, so I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you all about Data Together. Uh, Data Together is really more of a shift in our approach than a specific program. Uh, it builds on the work that JAWI and other organizations in the field have been championing for years uh, to implement an approach that is radically open. Uh, our goal is that by sharing as much data with each other as we can, we can break down the silos uh, that exist between us and accelerate research in the field. And specifically, this approach will allow all of us to share learnings and build on each other's work at a faster pace, uh, to have our values drive our data work and collaborations, and to uh, work against the extractive nature of a lot of research practices by centering the voices and needs of worker co-ops in our data and research work. Uh, so Data Together is really just one tool in our toolbox in terms of our approach towards helping others be successful. Uh, as Shev and Vanessa already described, uh, DAWI is deeply committed to championing new approaches and refining through cycles of learning in the projects we implement. 
Uh, and this new data approach will really allow us to make this a much more field facing field facing practice through which we hope we all can learn uh, and grow from. There are a number of amazing organizations in the field already doing really great data work. We're often working in research silos, so we want to work on breaking those down and supporting each other to build on our work in ways we may not be able to do on our own. Uh, originally created to meet the research needs in the field as a sister organization to the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives, uh, DOWI has had a number of accomplishments over the years in providing the field with both foundational and strategic research on what strategy could be built and impact could be shared to move the field forward. One of the core undertakings of DOWI is an effort to understand and quantify fieldwide changes. So most are familiar with our state of the sector report. Um, if you're not familiar with it, you can access it on our website, which is institute.coop. And the state of the sector report has been published annually since 2013 and has provided both us and our partners with key field understandings. Um, so some of the highlights from the things that we've learned include insights into the demographic shifts in who's using the worker cooperative model, allowing us to see that this has become primarily a woman, people of color and immigrant led movement. We've had insights into the growth of the field. So the number of total worker cooperatives in the US has grown 35% since 2014. And we've had insights into the high job quality offered at worker cooperatives, including the increasing uh, average higher wages since tracking began. Uh, last year, we were really excited to be able to report an average wage at workplaces surveyed of more than $19 an hour. So we now have an opportunity to build on this research success and really shift our role in terms of uh, data in the field to one that elevates the voices of worker owners in research and really supports other organizations to meaningfully access um, and build on the research that's already available. Through the launch of Data Together, we can unlock our potential for more research, more learnings, and more progress at a greater pace. This is really the urgency we need to meet the needs of our struggling communities right now. And we can do all of this while resting assured that the core of our data and research work uh, are really the principles that we embody in all of our other work. Uh, so equity, collaboration, transparency, um, and that we're really taking the lead from worker cooperatives that we study, uh, workplaces that already embody these principles every day. So how will we do this? Um, our focus for our data together will be ensuring that our data and research materials are much more public facing so this includes the tools that we use, the methods to our approach, and the resulting data sets. These materials will be made available to both practitioners and researchers. And additionally, we will make ourselves available um, to work with individuals and organizations to ensure that our partners have the tools that they need to meaningfully access and build on this research. And our hope is that this sharing will support innovation and the development of new approaches. Data together will also make our data practices more participatory. Um, so we want to ensure that our research approach is an equitable partnership with the community that we're working to understand, workers and worker owners. Uh, the next steps of this work will include us hosting focus groups of worker owners to get feedback on some of the current metrics to the impact metrics that we use to get a better sense of how our data could more immediately benefit worker owners directly. Uh, and this partnership will really allow us to deepen our understanding of worker cooperatives, but will also create more feedback loops that provide benefit directly back to the people and businesses that share their data with us. Uh, data Together will position DAWI to communicate impact and best practices quickly and to build on each other's work collaboratively. This will position us as a field to respond to the needs of existing worker cooperatives. And by harnessing data as a tool of communication and building a field-wide shared uh, understanding of worker cooperatives, uh, data can really be the bridge that will allow us to better mobilize resources and shift policy in this critical moment. Um, so we want you all obviously to get involved in this work. Uh, in the immediate sense, the way that you can do that is by signing up to receive our new monthly data-related newsletter. Uh, we will include updates there about our progress in using the data together approach. And you can also visit our website to learn about the materials and data set we already have available for public access. 
And lastly, we of course want to approach all of this work with the issue of privacy at its core. Uh, the trust that individuals and businesses put in us um, by sharing their data is paramount to our work. And we want to ensure that um, transparency and openness are balanced with privacy in terms of our methods and data sharing. Um, in general, we live in a society where our data is bought, sold, and misused all the time. So we want to approach our work differently by continuing to invest in the trust that people put in us to keep their data secure. Uh, and with that, I think I'll pass it back to Julian. Thank you so much, Olga. A um, uh, great uh, overview of our new program, Data Together. I'm going to go ahead and actually pass it to Melissa, who will uh, give us a recap before we launch into our Q&A session. Okay, so um, we learned a few things very early on in the poll. Uh, 19000 of the $30,000 that it takes to start a new business from scratch are missing um, in Black communities. Uh, because of systematic stripping of wealth. So what fills that gap? We think it's capital coming from the private sector and the public sector, and we're working to push in that direction with the legacy fund, and then all of the other activities around that. 30%, um, 32% of companies are moving from an employment relationship to using contingent workers um, as their workforce. Um, and that's growing and it's systematizing and it has a whole ecosystem of capital and technological support around it. Um, so we're seeing increasingly um, contingent jobs. A, and there have been people who always had contingent jobs, people who lack documentation, people who have been incarcerated, people who can't get a job for whatever reason, there are a number of reasons. Those people still need to work and support themselves and they are also entitled to quality jobs like all other human beings. We are coming up with a model that started out working with dreamers and other young people out of college and hoping to learn from it enough to expand it um, and work at the systems level to support others to develop their own models to put people to work in ways that they have control over and benefit from. And finally, um, we are gonna help people succeed by collaborating with them, not just on training and policy and communication on data, helping them measure their own impact, participate with us in um, studying the field and pull in the people who are themselves being studied to inform that studying. So making everything much more radically open and available um, so that we don't all have to do <laughs> the sort of gather the same data in the silos that we may have been working in. Um, this is just the beginning of our work. And at the beginning of this presentation, I invited you to see yourself in the work. And I wanna leave by inviting you to partner actively with us, build this with us. We build the road together as we go. Dowie has an incredible team um, of delightful people who are a joy to work with. Um, and we have a strong vision and some resources to put that vision into practice. We see ourselves as in service to the field. And if you're on this call, then you're part of the field, whatever aspect of it um, you are. So um, come in, work with us, talk to us. We'll be doing more webinars um, about other assets and facets of our work um, over the next couple months. Um, but this is really kind of the big foundational vision. Um, and then I think we have time. Looks like we have a little bit of time for Q&A. Thanks so much, Melissa. Um, as Melissa mentioned, this is the first in a series of webinars where we'll be able to dig deeper into this work. Um, obviously, uh, high levels of engagement um, have has been a, a theme throughout everything shared today. So we want to be able to um, we want to ensure that we engage with you and invite you in and build along alongside you um, in the coming months and years. Uh, so we hope that you will join us for those webinars as well as and and we'll be featuring some of our new partnerships and rolling out some of our uh, uh, some more programs as well um, during those events. Thank you for those who submitted questions beforehand. Um, we do have a few minutes to go over a couple of those. I'm going to stop sharing um, as we launch into our first question. Um, then we'll open up the chat and so folks can uh, ask anything that's at top of mind right now. Um, but the, the first question that came in um, earlier was, is Dawi doing all of um, its other work beyond just the uh, um, to, beyond this campaign? So, School for Democratic Management, Workers to Owners. What happens to all of that work? 
I can feel the first part of that and then um, kick over to my colleagues if you have um, dimensions to add. Yes, we are still doing most, if not all, of our other work. Um, so this is more of a yes and than a replacement. We're going to you'll see some changes in that work as we focus it around these strategic areas. But for instance, we're still convening workers to owners. We're still doing technical assistance and consulting. We're still running the School for Democratic Management. Now what the content is and who we're recruiting to it um, and how we're doing the work is shifting um, to align with our strategic priorities and with the needs um, of the moment. But at, at a general level, um, yes, with a, with, with a shift. Do others want to say anything more specific than that? That was perfect. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, Melissa. Um, also, we had a question about uh, the fund development work that um, we're working on, uh, specifically Apis and Heritage. Um, does DAWI's, how does DAWI's fund development work differ or engage with any of the other fund development that is happening within the field? Um, led by other organizations. Melissa, maybe you and I can share the space on this one um, and you can focus in on like how it's different, how, or the unique value add. I think the, the key thing with the fund is that, you know, uh, Todd Leverett, who runs the legacy business program has uh, been spearheading the fund with us and has been working with the field, learning from the existing uh, field of funds. So we've gained a lot of insight and um, over these last year, about a year and a half of doing our due diligence and really thinking about how to shape this model so that we can be target um, and specific to BIPOC communities, uh, businesses that have workforces with people of color and our owners with people of color and industries that are viable and essential at this time. So they've done a great job of bringing in partners thus far. And as we execute the work, we hope to bring back these lessons learned and have convene um, partners in the field that were already um, assisting us as we develop the fund. Um, but we also wanna bring in new, um, new lenders, new investors, people that are eager to think about employee ownership and expand their purview in, uh, and meet new um, workers to owners members. I don't know that I can um, add a whole lot to that. It, I will point out it is the only Black-led employee ownership investment fund in the country um, that we know of so far. And it retains a, a very specific racial equity focus in buying businesses that have majority minority workforces. Um, so it's aiming to make a wealth transfer from um, probably mostly white business ownership to um, black and brown business ownership by buying and transitioning businesses. Um, and we're not sure that's been done before in that explicit of a way. So we wanna share um, the learnings and as Chef said, hope to move capital. We hope that our excess, success will inspire additional investment, not just in the fund, but in other funds. Um, we have another question that has come through from uh, Victoria, who asks, what specific strategies need to be employed right now to ensure that policy changes, um, legislative, economic, and otherwise, can help ensure equitable recovery are made in a permanent, not a piecemeal or temporary way? Oh, if only we had that luxury. I mean, you know, we're, we're trying to get in where we fit in. So I hear you on the need for permanent changes. Um, I think that there is an opportunity. I think we have built enough groundwork with federal, um, with Hill staffers in particular, um, but also with agencies. Um, so I think there's a dual, there's the legislation, which we're, you know, sending memos in first hundred days memos, you know, to various Hill staffers. And there's already legislation in progress to try and implement um, support for employee ownership and worker co-ops everything from financing to workforce development to small business support. So there's the legislation, but I, we have been focusing just as much on the actual agencies themselves and the people who work in those agencies, many of whom we have long standing relationships with and who are still there even after the last four years are still at the agency. Some leadership has turned over, some you know field staff have turned over, but um, making sure that 
the spirit of legislation actually gets enacted is as critical as getting legislation passed. So I think, you know, don't underestimate working with the people who are actually doing the work um, is, is what I would say. And I think that's where we need all of us to talk to your local field offices, to call um, agency staff, you know, to partner with them. They want to partner with us um, on a lot of this implementation. Um, and policy is a wild and woolly world. And so we are just trying to like, uh, as much as we can be opportunistic while also laying longer term groundwork for kind of for bigger things like multi-agency initiatives or, you know, changes to the tax code and things like that. Thanks so much, Melissa. Um, we have one more, and then if you, if anyone um, on the call has a question that they'd like to ask, feel free to add that into the chat. Um, and the other question is regarding Dawi's role um, or involvement in developing worker cooperatives, what is the unique value add um, to that work um, in the field, considering that there are many developers? So I can chime in on this one and then other colleagues can, can add. Um, so I think Dowie has um, a particular viewpoint of <clears throat> being connected with um, the field, right, um, broadly and nationally. And so um, we are, for example, in the case of the work that I described, you know, um, able to sort of aggregate, right, the, the lessons learned, the tools, and to really be able to, um, you know, sort of lift that up and, and play around with it, right, and pilot that work. So that then um, others are prepared to take that work on. So we are not necessarily interested in being in the business of co-op development for the long haul, right? Um, that's the work locally that's being done, but we are here to, to try new things, to inform the field, to um, you know, create standards, uh, metrics, et cetera. And so that's, that's what we are really interested in doing. And, and by doing this together with the, the field of co-op developers, um, is I think where we're gonna really be successful, right? Um, and trying these new forms out. So anybody else wanna add to that? Excellent. All right. Thank you so much. Um, and actually, we do have one more. Uh, we have five minutes left, so just we'll sneak this one in. Um, and that's regarding international examples. Um, wondering if there are any international examples of recovery that are informing um, this stage of Dawi's work, um, be it Argentina or Emilia Romagna. Um, any inspirations there? Things that we're looking at that are informing this work. I don't know, but it's a little early for recovery yet. I think we haven't seen, I mean, you know, um, we're familiar with the international examples and various of us are in different study groups and learning from um, those things all the time. There's an excellent study group happening right now out of North Carolina on ecosystem approaches. Um, I think the thing that I'm personally, one of the things I'm most excited about is the platform co-op movement. Um, Dowie joined the platform cooperative consortium. Uh, last year, and we're looking at, um, you know, sort of how we can get more involved and learn from uh, what's truly an international um, set of players. And one of the things that's exciting about the platform co-op work is that it's happening in the global south um, it, with contingent workers to a, a great degree, um, you know, as well as in Europe and Asia and, you know, sort of all over the world. So, that to me is something to keep an eye on internationally. I think especially as we see the growth of, um, you know, labor arrangements that aren't designed to protect workers, we need to be looking at tech platforms um, and various other, other, other platforms for aggregating. So um, early stages yet, but that's my excitement. Yeah, I, I think um, this is sort of off the cuff. So, you know, you, you'll have to, think of this answer as like Shavanti's answer. I, I feel very compelled by what's happening internationally, partly because we, we need a solidarity movement that really learns um, together, right? With our international partners. And I know there are national organizations based out of the US that are, that are already doing really great work. And the field has ties to Puerto Rico, other locations uh, that, that are connected to the US, um, Canada, et cetera, that I think we should continue to cultivate. Um, 
I think there needs to be power that that's being built and and stories that are being told about successes of companies, how they've pivoted, you know, uh, industries, how they've adjusted uh, to the to the crisis of COVID, um, despite um, international differences. I think those stories can actually carry a lot of weight in the way we are able to t communicate that here. Um, sometimes hearing a, a story um, that is an international example allows people to sort of break out of their si silo or their, their mental model about what's possible here in the United States um, and might get, give sort of inspiration to, to new ways of thinking about things. So for me, uh, at least it's, it's a source of inspiration and a, a place for solidarity. Thank you so much, Shivanti. Um, okay, well, we're, we're at time today. I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, as mentioned, the next few months and years require us to be uh, require us to collaborate at high level. So we look forward to engaging with you all. Feel free to reach out to our team members. Um, visit institute.coop slash ownership now to learn more um, and learn more uh, about in particular about uh, data together. Um, and you can sign up for our data newsletter there. We'll also follow up with you all with a recording of this webinar and we look forward to working together. Take care.